Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Guru Ve Gaura Chandraya Radhikaya Taralaye Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tara Bhaktaya Namo Namaha Yam Prabhajanta Manapetyam Apeti Krityam Dwai Paino Viraha Katara Ujuhava Putre Titam Mayatayo Tarava Vinidustam Sarvabhutam Munimana Toshmi Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Vyatisam Batojaya Tudiraye I first of all offer millions and millions of Dandavat pranams unto the lotus feet of my most beloved Gurudev. Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Astota Sarashishimad Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. And the same again millions of millions of times unto the lotus feet of our most beloved Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Astota Sarashishimad Srila Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. And all the Vaishnava and Vaishnavi devotees of the Lord and Dandavat pranams. So, uh, I was thinking that Budara would be here this morning. He's leaving tomorrow, Budara. And uh, I was wanting to um, just again reiterate the. I will anyway. So, we've been studying through. From the first to the second, now we're in the third canto, and we're at this Kapila Dev Devahuti Sambad, which is complex in the sense that it's very clear analysis of how we manifested in this world, how this world itself manifested, and how Krishna manifested in this world in the other way around to what I've just said. Krishna first, then the world, then the jiva. So, if we have this understanding very solidly, and I was realizing this is the sixth time that the Virata Rupa form has been described. This is the sixth time that the Virata Rupa is about to be described. And in each time it's described, there's new awareness and appreciation for the center only being Krishna and me as a jiva being incredibly infinitesimal. So this creates an understanding immediately of Sambandha Gyan. What is that infinitesimal's relationship with that Supreme Lord? So this understanding is spoken again and again and again. It's not something that we are probably ever going to understand. It's called Achintya Bhav. It's inconceivable. We have to have this mood, this Bhav, of accepting the inconceivable. If we have that appreciation, then we can begin to appreciate the immensity of this knowledge that is actually being bestowed through the Bhagavatam. So we should appreciate that this Bhagavatam is a complete picture. It's the total summation of all explanation about our situation. There's nothing missing at all. So sometimes devotees, when they get to these chapters, it's a little difficult and they might just gloss them through, think they'll get to something more easily comprehensible. But without this topic, it's not complete. The Bhagavatam will not be complete. It's like a chain. And if you take one of the links out of the chain, the whole chain is going to be actually useless. So here Kapiladev, he's taking the um, time to explain extensively. Now, just before I start to speak on that topic um, in a focused way, I just want to reiterate the glories of the Bhagavatam. It's very wonderful to hear daily the glories of the Bhagavatam. 
So I'm just going to just for a few moments just make this platform more solid. I mean, last night we were talking about Vatsali Abhav. We were talking about Krishna in Braj, the Bridge of Basis. This is all from the Bhagavatam. Today we're going to be talking about the material elements, the cosmic egg, the Mahatattva, the Ahanka. This is all from the Bhagavatam. It's like huge encompassing picture. So we have to appreciate the enormity of the gift of the Bhagavatam. So now in the 12th canto, in the very last chapter, the 13th chapter, it's 22 verses, and it's beautiful glorification of the Bhagavatam. And it's very special to hear this glorification. I'm just going to read some translations. I'm going to start from verse 10. And the translation is, it was to Lord Brahma that the personality, Supreme Personality of God had first revealed the Srimad Bhagavatam in full. Even though it's only four verses, we fluffed out those verses a few months ago with the Chatu Shloki description. So in full, this is given. At that time, Brahma was frightened by material existence. Now we also should be frightened by our material predicament that we found ourselves in. We don't know everything. We practically don't know anything, <laughs> really. We don't even know how our hair grows or our nails grow. We don't know the dynamics of this world. Practically, we can't even remember what we did yesterday. But this powerful illusion of the false ego thinking that I know something is such an obstacle, such an obstruction. You know, have you ever tried to teach someone and they're saying to you all the time, oh, I know that already, I know that already. Actually, they don't know anything. It's like sometimes with some Indians, God bless them, you know, they're knowing everything. You know, you're trying to explain something of a but actually they know everything. So after a while you just get impatient, you can't go there. So we sometimes, because we know a little bit, we know that we breathe, we know that we eat, we know we have material desires, we know these basic things, but we have this incredible, powerful sense of ego, which Shivji has given to us, this ahankara, ahamkara. What does aham? Aham means I, kara means the doer, I am the doer this misconception of being the doer. This is why Sri Bhagavatam is given. So Lord Brahma, he's feeling a little frightened. You know, he's sitting on a lotus and there's this enormous ocean, these waves that are being um, tossed about by the effulgence coming from Krishna's Brahma Jyoti. And he has no one to speak to and he doesn't know anything and he's sitting on this lotus, he's a little intimidated by the whole, he doesn't, he doesn't even have a mother and father, you know, to say, it's all right, son, you know, it'll be okay. He's just there like an orphan on this lotus. He can't even go anywhere. He tries to go somewhere. He becomes restless. He goes down the stem of the lotus looking for its origin, but he's afraid, he's frightened. So what does the Bhagavatam give him? It pacifies his fear. Dviti ya binivyeshitam syat isad upatasya vipare yoshmriti. This verse, Gurudev spent a whole book on this verse. Bayam dviti ya binivyeshitam syat. Bayam, fear, is manifested by the material illusion. As long as I think I'm the material body, I'm going to be afraid. This is the root. So this root is about to be expelled by Krishna himself manifesting as the Bhagavatam. At the very beginning of creation, it's like if you buy any appliance, it comes with a manual of how to use it. If you don't take advantage of the manual, then you're probably not going to be able to optimize whatever that appliance is. Similarly, we won't optimize this human birth unless we study the manual. And the manual is quite, you know, in depth, which is what we're coming to today. So it's an appreciation. And it came to Lord Brahma when he was frightened by material existence, was sitting on the lotus flower that had grown from the Lord's navel. He didn't know that at the time. From the beginning to the end of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is full of narrations that encourage 
renunciation of material life. It is not saying renunciation. I was reading this morning very carefully. If it had said renunciation, that would have been different because basically we have nothing to renounce. We own nothing. It's like a bank clerk, I've said many times that analogy, he throws his hands in the air, says, I renounce all the money in the bank. <laughs> they will look at it, a puggle or something, what? You know, he doesn't own anything. So also, how can we renounce anything in this world? We can't, we don't own anything. But it's not saying that. It's saying renunciation of material life. This means the desire to try and exploit something from this material environment for my own sensual pleasure. Sensual. I'm trying to use my material senses. I'm saying this word very clearly because we're going to talk about the senses this morning, where they come from, how they have manifested. When we know the whole arrangement, the analysis, it's a lot easier to purify it. It's like, for example, if someone's feeling very depressed, not uncommon in this world, and they suddenly realize they got a liver deficiency. A liver deficiency will cause depression. So all of a sudden they think, well, I'm not really depressed anymore. I just have a bad liver. So you understand, by understanding our problem, then we can separate our real identity from the problem. There becomes a space. This is called detachment. Detachment from the material life. This is what it's saying. Renunciation of material life. Can I renounce the material life? Have I got so ensnared in it that I can't cut it, chop it? Gurudev used to call us having tails, you know? That was how he'd describe it. He wanted to cut our tails, you know? That attachment for some sensual pleasure. So it's not renunciation. Big difference. Renunciation of material life, as well as nectarian accounts of Lord Hari's transcendental pastimes, which give ecstasy to the saintly devotees and demigods. This is like we were listening to that pastime last night. I mean, I was watching everyone from here, and I could see that everyone was very satisfied hearing the sweetness of Uddhava's presentation, or actually a little bit irritated by Uddhava's presentation, that he was trying to actually bring Nanda Baba more into an Aishwarya mood. But the whole um, pastime in Vrindavan was, is very special. So these are the sweet nectarian pastimes which give ecstasy to the saintly devotees and demigods. This Bhagavatam is the essence of all Vedanta philosophy because its subject matter is the absolute truth. We get so much short-changed in this world so many times people will not speak to you their real feelings because of fear of their own identity being, you know, unsettled, whatever, for so many different reasons. But the absolute truth is not a common commodity today, even though it's the last remaining leg of the cow. But still, the absolute truth is not really... We have to have some courage in this whole process to accept that absolute truth. The first courage is accepting that I'm spirit soul and not this great wonderful body that I always thought I was. That also has to, because at death it will just take it away anyway, that misconception. Which, while non-different from the spirit soul, i read that, this Bhagavatam is the essence of all Vedanta philosophy because its subject matter is the absolute truth, which, while non-different from the spirit soul, the absolute truth and the spirit soul are non-different is the ultimate reality, one without a second. The goal of this literature is exclusively devotional service unto that supreme truth. So this devotional service is the essence, the bhakti sa. it's described, the essence, the current. And we discussed, Krishna Chakravarti Thakur is saying that the essence of the whole Bhagavatam is Bhakti Devi herself. This is the essence of the Bhagavatam. I'm saying this this morning because this particular chapter we've reached is called the Fundamental Principles of Material Nature. It's really twisty. It has 72 verses in it. It's huge. It's, the, it's been giving me fear for the last eight, nine weeks. I think I must have listened to it like probably 20, 30 times, gone through it. So, and still, I'm so far away from understanding it. The more I seem to catch it, then suddenly slips and becomes twice as big again. 
and then I try to boil it down and catch it, a summary, something to offer, and then again it slips and becomes twice as big again. And it's like each time I think that I'm getting some comprehension, it just starts to get bigger. It, it, there's like no limit to the depth of the ocean of this Bhagavatam, actually. When you're really using every little bit of... I don't have much brain, really and truly. I never was good in school. I never was good in studying. You know, and I wanted to understand this chapter so I could present it. And it's just been like going into this endless, endless, endless ocean, which symptomizes the nature of the Bhagavatam itself. It's like an ocean without a shore. This is the glory. Shila, um, Madhusudan Maharaj, he used to describe, or does describe, that it's like, a, like Garuda flying in the sky, and the sky has no limit. Even though it's such a big bird like Garuda, but still, there's no limit to the sky. There's no limit to the sky of the Bhagavatam. And the goal being devotional service. Now it's saying some very glorification here. All other Puranic scriptures shine forth in the assembly of saintly devotees only as long as that great ocean of nectar, Srimad Bhagavatam, is not heard. These are beautiful verses from the 12th canto, chapter 13. Srimad Bhagavatam is declared as the essence of all Vedanta philosophy, Vedanta philosophy. One who has felt satisfaction from its nectarian mellow will never be attracted to any other literature. Nothing else can fill that hole in the heart. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur calls it the treasure of satisfaction of the heart. That's what he calls this Bhagavatam, the treasure. We all want this treasure of satisfaction of the heart. You know, that's something very wonderful to actually go for. O Brahmanas, in the same way that city of Kashi is unexcelled among holy places, Srimad Bhagavatam is supreme among all the Puranas. Srimad Bhagavatam is the spotless Purana. Nir Matsaram. Nir Matsaram. Matsa. Matsara means envy. Nir Matsara. There's no envy in this whole Bhagavatam. It is devoid of that. This whole material atmosphere is crackling with envy. There is nothing but envy. Not in Vrindavan, so much. It's really held back. But in the rest of the world, where they're struggling to acquire more material possessions than is their due. And it's just everyone is envious of everyone else. Prabhupada talked a lot about this. Um, is, most, is, is most dear to the Vaishnavas because it describes the pure and supreme knowledge of the Paramahamsas. This Bhagavatam reveals the means for becoming free from all work together with the process of transcendental knowledge, renunciation, and devotion. So, Gyan, Vairagya, and Bhakti. And we understand that Bhakti Devi is the goddess. And Gyan and Vairagya are like her two sons. You know, the pastime of Gokarna. This is very beautiful in the, in the um, Bhagavat Mahatmya. Beautiful story of Gokarna. Very inspirational to read. Anyone who seriously tries to understand Srimad Bhagavatam, who properly hears and chants it with devotion, becomes completely liberated. Now, it's interesting that it's saying liberation, because we know that liberation in one sense is the goal of the jnanis. So we are not jnanis. We are going to study today some jnan. But we not with the intention of becoming liberated from this world. Actually, the devotees who are chanting Hare Krishna are already liberated from this world. We should appreciate it. I can remember one time in uh, Puri, Gurudev, uh, he banged me on the head. <laughs> and he said, now you are liberated. <laughs> and then Madhav Maharaj came in straight away and said, oh, Tridani Maharaj is liberated now. And they made a big... F but actually, it was true. We are liberated. We are already, we already on the path. We're already liberated from so much material hankering and desires. All of us. I'm looking at you all. I can see. We all are. We've purified such a degree of our material desire. Of course, we want to purify more. But we're already basically liberated. And we're already well on this track, on this path. 
Prabhupada used to talk and say that we're in the shower. We're already in the shower. We're already cleaning. We're in process. Now, coming to our subject matter. So, the 25th chapter of this third canto we discussed yesterday establishes very solidly devotional service. And that devotional service can only flourish in the association of sadhus. There are many verses in that um, chapter describing the qualities of a sadhu, the activities of a sadhu, and the nishta of a sadhu. These are described in the 25th chapter. And then the necessity of having association with sadhus. At some point though, the devotee has to realize if he's already had extensive association with a sadhu, that he should start to capitalize on the wealth and treasure that that sadhu has actually imparted to him. It's not like he spends his life running in the marketplace looking for the next sadhu, next sadhu, next sadhu. What has the previous sadhu given you? What has Srila Pramod Puri Maharaj given in your heart already? What has Srila Gurudev already put in? What has Bhaktivedanta Swami already put in your heart? What is that already there? If we're not um, appreciating that gift sufficiently, we should be a little reflective. We have the process of our chanting. It develops reflection on what gift we have already been given. So this is the path of bhakti that is being described to Devahuti. Now, she wants more understanding. It's not sufficient, the words that Kapila Dev has already given her. So now Kapila Dev begins to describe the different categories of the Absolute. This is called Sankhya philosophy. And remember what I said just at the beginning of the class. You can't miss out one link of the chain. This is a link in the chain of the Bhagavatam. Don't think this is just too, you know, um, scientific. And I'll just skip through to Lord Shiva battling with Daksha in the next canto, which is much more easy to appreciate and understand those sentiments. But here, um, Kapila Dev is describing these categories of the absolute truth. And he's describing supreme knowledge. Knowledge of our existence, knowledge of how this world manifested from the Pradhan. He begins to talk about the Pradhan and the Prakriti. Who can tell me what is the Pradhan? We've heard so many times. Okay, that's one answer. Yes. It's the original. It's like the mother's womb. It hasn't been impregnated yet. It has all the capabilities of producing a child if the seed is injected. But the Pradhan is the unmanifested state. That's the Pradhan. We need to try to, we have to hear this 10,000 times to get the picture. Yesterday we were talking about getting a picture. So the Pradhan is the unmanifested state. And this is what Kapila Dev is explaining at the beginning of this chapter. And this is considered knowledge. Prior to this, in verse 4 and 5, in verse 9 he begins to describe this. He again is reiterating that actually all existence is manifesting from Krishna. Again, he's putting that as the principle. And now from that understanding, we are going to elaborate. But we know what is the root. Where is the heart? It is all manifesting from Sri Krishna. Because if we have nothing else, none of this knowledge, but we do appreciate that Krishna is that supreme controller, that supreme personality. Our bhakti is intact. Our bhakti will grow and flourish and blossom. If we're fully appreciating, that means we're not an atheist or agnostic or something like that. We understand. Not only understand that he's the Supreme, but who is Krishna? This is why Prabhupada gave us the Krishna book. Immediately he gave us that first. It was the first book he ever gave practically. He gave three Bhagavatams, 
first canto, and then he gave the Krishna book to know who was Krishna. So now this Pradhan is being described. So the Pradhan is like the conglomerate soup, you can say. It's the embryo. It doesn't have a seed inside it yet. Now when Shambhu, he is responsible for carrying that glance from Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu, Rama Devi is Mahavishnu's consort. She knows the desire of Mahavishnu. The purpose of Mahavishnu, the purpose of this Purush avatar is to create the material worlds in service to Sri Krishna who wants to demonstrate his Karuna Shakti. Krishna wants to show his compassion. Can he show his compassion in Vaikuntha or Goloka Vrindavan? Everyone is completely happy there. How can he show this excellent, superb, supreme quality of Karuna Shakti, compassion? He can't show it in those places. So he wants to manifest this material world to demonstrate that and to perform his Leela. So from Sankarshan, from Mahasankarshan, is manifesting Mahavishnu, the three Purush avatars. First, Mahavishnu. We have to hear this so many times, even if we heard it a million times before, every time we hear it again, something extra clicks into place. The picture becomes a little more clear. And with that clarity of vision, our confidence in this knowledge also is reconfirmed. I'm not just a stumbling, bumbling, you know, very near fight devotee wandering around <coughs> trying to understand these subject matters. I've actually understood, at least intellectually, something. <coughs> so, he's describing the Pradhan being impregnated. First of all, within the Pradhan are the embryos of all the elements, the 27 elements earth, water, fire, air, ether, the subtle elements, which is um, taste, uh, what is it first, it's uh, sound, sound, touch, um, what is it? sound, touch, uh, then uh, uh, taste, fragrance, I missed out one, um, huh, I said touch. Sight, yes. So, yeah. Let me get my map. You see, you have to have maps. This is a map. Very simple. Of the elements. So we have form, taste, smell, touch, sound. These are the sense objects. Then there's subtle aspects. So, this Pradhan has all this potential. And then this seed of what is contained in the seed that's manifesting from Mahavishnu? What is the seed? Not you. What is the seed? What is in the seed? Jiva and? 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 Huh? No, not even super soul. Come on. I was going to go a lot further today, but we have to. Tungi. Don't let me down now. You know, you know these, you know all these things, really. Actually, you know, it's, it's a phenomenon. We all know this, but it's just not like on the front burner, you know? So we have to try and revel back through the archives and pick up. It's within the Kastuba money of Krishna, actually. What is the vital ingredient to kickstart the whole creation? Without it, it doesn't work. You've all, all right, you've said the jiva, very good. Now, what is the next ingredient? That without it, nothing will happen. Time. If there's no conception of past, present, and future, nothing will progress. There will be no evolution. Nothing can happen. In the spiritual reality, there is no time. It's all the powerful present. There's no past. There's no future. It's all happening now. Just like a child can often be in that state of consciousness. They are up to speed with the present, so to speak, you know? They're actually acting in that moment. 
And there's many Gyanis actually on the planet who are running around telling people how to access that through Gyan. You know, different people, they give seminars and so on, how to become, you know, in the present moment. It's not mixed with bhakti, it's just pure Gyan. So you can do that through the path of knowledge. But without the loving sentiment of devotion, so within the seed is the jiva and time. This is impregnated. How come you didn't tell me this? You must know this. You were waiting for them to say. This is really basic. You see, this is the knowledge from the Bhagavatam. How can any of it be omitted? Because once we start to appreciate it deeply, regularly, then our consciousness is going to expand to accommodate it. You know, even scientists say that we only use one-tenth of our brain. But devotees use a lot more than that. They access, you know, the subconscious through these links, through this teaching. Because you have to be quite broad-minded for it just to accommodate that, you know, those beautiful sweet pastimes we were discussing last night are from the same body of literature as this quite analytical knowledge. So the, the sadhak always, is always reconciling. So the jiva and time are impregnated into the pradhan. And then, what is the pradhan called? Not yet. That's what comes as a result. But there's another term, essential term. Prakriti. The pradhan now becomes the prakriti. It has all been excited by time. And the three modes of material nature immediately become active and act upon the jiva. This is very scientific presentation. Even if we don't understand it, it doesn't matter. As long as we have high regard for that knowledge and know it's there. Beg your pardon? No, no. Lord Brahma has not even appeared yet. No, no. This is um, it's a good question, Tungi. You're getting the picture. I'm encouraged you want to see the whole picture. No, Lord Brahma is coming from the next Purush avatar, who is Garava Dakshayi Vishnu. The first is Maha Vishnu. Karana Dakshayi Vishnu, same. And he's impregnated the Pradhan. The Pradhan has now become the Prakriti. The Prakriti is starting to manifest. The senses are all there. They're all being manifested. And at this point, into each singular universes, because Mahavishnu, Karnadaksha Vishnu, he's lying in this causal ocean. And from the pores of his skin are unlimited billions of universes manifesting. We could say unlimited trillions, but it's a lot. You know, it's inconceivable, the amounts, the immensity of it all. It's, it's heavy, it's, it's, it's healthy for us to contemplate these immense conceptions. You know, it takes us across boundaries of consciousness, just thinking about it. And it's all in connection with Krishna and devotion. So everything is positive, everything is plus. We will boil it down to that, yes. But to reconcile Tungi's inquiry, we had to broaden it, and then we'll reduce it again. So that impregnation is the impregnation. It's called Hiranya Jeev. It's the embryo of all Jeevas in existence have come in that one seed from Mahavishnu. And then that, from that one embryo is going to manifest billions of living entities, all coming from Mahavishnu. It's quite simple because we can relate it like with a seed of a tree. In a tiny little seed, you know, of a banyan tree, for example, or a huge oak tree, you know, there's so much about to come, but it's just in a tiny little seed form. So similarly, this jiva and time contains the essence to produce all these universes with life. The external energy was already present in the form of the pradhan, but it was unmanifested. It couldn't do anything without the impregnation of time and the jiva. It was already there. 
interesting questions. Did you mention the plants being Sadashiva on the, the Durga potency? No, I didn't go right into that because that's not so much discussed in this particular chapter. I would like to go into that. I understand that very clearly. We just had Shiva Ratri. <laughs> but this is not what's being described in this chapter. It's a different slant on it, you know? So he's basically saying Shambhu is the impregnating of the Durga principle, the Yoni. This is the cosmic painting, the cosmic picture of what actually takes place. But when all this has been impregnated, then it's described how these material elements, they um, form what is called the Virat Rupa manifestation of Krishna. These elements. It's described at this point that the demigods, but these are the eternal not eternal, but they are the highest demigods. Not just in a localized planet, not just in a localized universe. And from these elements, a form of Krishna manifests. And this is the Virat Rupa. This form is the amalgamation of all what is about to come is within that Virat Rupa form of Krishna. It, it, it's like it's so inconceivable, we just have to accept this information. If you're interested and fascinated by it, then you should know and have comfort that it's all explained, you know, in different sections of the Bhagavatam, six or seven times, this particular pastime that we're talking about. It's so many times described. But in this chapter, it's very, very analytical indeed. Because Kapiladev wants to liberate his mother, Devahuti, completely from any attachment to this world. So he's describing, this is why he's describing it, to inspire detachment. Once we see the whole picture and how it is, then I can actually become freed from that involvement. So this um, Virata Rupa, this form, then lies down in the ocean. Now this ocean is the localized ocean within each um, universe. And this is the Garbadok ocean. This is the second Purush avatar. Three Purush avatars. Don't forget them. Karnadakshai Vishnu, Garbadakshai Vishnu, and Shiradakshai Vishnu. Shiradakshai Vishnu is very local in the heart of all jivas as super soul. Garbhadakshai Vishnu is at the bottom of each individual universe. So we've gone from one experience of the Pradhan and Prakriti, which results, as you said initially, in the Mahatattva. Mahatattva means the great truth. And from the Mahatattva is coming the Ahankar. Ahankar is this false conception. Because the spirit soul has come in at this time, way back at the beginning with Mahavishnu, in that seed. But the spirit soul is just anxious to enjoy matter. And it can't enjoy matter unless it has a matter body. If it still thinks, well, I'm spirit, but I'm going to try and have a go at enjoying matter, it, it won't get a drop of pleasure. Because spirit can't enjoy material um, substance. It, it can't enjoy materially. Can it? It can try. <laughs> we do try. <laughs> you know, but th there's no... The spirit can't enjoy matter. So the ahankara, this I am the doer, is given by Shivji, Shambhu, covers our identity. We're in illusion from that very beginning. And then the jivas are distributed into all the unlimited billions of universes with the false ego. And they are all residing in embryo, in Garbhadakshai Vishnu, this second Purush avatar. And then by, I've described this before, this is described back in this same canto, Lord Brahma is describing that the force 
of their desire to enjoy material energy pierces the navel of Garbhadakshai Vishnu and the lotus comes. We actually pierce Garbhadakshai's navel. That's the word that's used by the force of our desire to enjoy. And then the lotus is produced and then Lord Brahma is there. And then the creation of this world starts to take place. Now, this Virata Rupa form is described here as it's lying down and it's, it hasn't woken up. So let me just interrupt here for a minute. I'm going to read you literally the verses from this chapter and then we'll catch up the um, message of this particular chapter because it's different from other descriptions. What I've described to date is pretty much the same as what's already been described, but this has some difference to it. It's some elaboration. It's more technical. So the jivas are placed in the womb of Prakriti and agitated by the gunas and time. Okay? We've already said that. Prakriti gives birth to the Mahatattva. Right? We've said that. Clear. This is called Hiranya Mayam, the great brilliance. Hiranya means gold. Mayam, brilliance. And this Mahatattva is the seed of the universe. Without, uh, oh, then it's saying it swallowed up all the... Um, darkness that was covering because of its brilliance. It was so bright. So Prakriti gives birth to the Mahatattva. So the Pradhan is injected, becomes Prakriti, gives birth to the Mahatattva. Mahatattva is represented as Chitta in the body. Chitta is the place of consciousness. Thoughts, Chitta. Chaitanya means consciousness. Chitta. It means the place where our thoughts originate. So this chitta originally is in sattva gun. It's in its pure gun. But it comes in contact with material objects and immediately becomes contaminated. And the example is of water. When water, um, uh, in its original state, is absolutely pure. But when it comes in touch with earth, then so many other contaminations come into it. Similarly, our essential chitta is absolutely pure, totally pure, but it comes in contact with matter, so then it becomes impure. Desires arise. So, um, um, then these transformations of this Mahatattva are induced by the Lord's power. And this Ahankara, this false ego, is endowed with Shakti. We have Shakti even in this material situation to appreciate our situation. Without having the ability to think, even in material consciousness, we're not going to actually get out of this place. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says the mind is the only instrument we have to actually develop this connection with the higher realm. We have to use this material mind. This material mind, when it's purified, then it can connect with the highest purity. That's our process from the day one. When we first become devotees, we're trying to purify our lives, and our mind internally. We're trying to purify. It's this process of purification so we can perform pure devotional service and connect with that which is most pure, which initially is my Shuddha Chitta, and then with Krishna. So this is the uh, process that's been described here. Now there's a very interesting part that's only being described in this particular chapter. And this is the last part that I'm going to speak on about today. And this begins at the 50th verse of this chapter. And it's described how this personality, this Virata Rupa, is lying in this water, ocean, Garbhadak Ocean, and cannot be woken up. The Devas are trying to wake up this Virata Rupa. 
and it's described. I'm going to go through it, and just I'm going to say it just like it is, and whatever it lands on you. You won't understand it, but you can hear it, because we should hear how this um, is presented for our purification. So it's described that the god of fire entered his mouth of this sleeping form, Virata Rupa, and he wouldn't wake up. The god of wind enters his nostrils, and he wouldn't wake up. The sun god entered his eyes, but he wouldn't wake up. The dig davitas, the directions of, uh, in, in the world of the sound, entered his ears, but he didn't wake up. Actually, I'm so happy that Gopi's come this morning, because I spoke to Gopi about what I was about to present, and he gave me such beautiful insight into the necessity of actually hearing this, because it's part of the chain of the knowledge, the transcendental knowledge that's been delivered. It's a part of it. So it's not something that can be just glossed over and thought, well, you know, I'll do that another time. <laughs> then the deities of the skin try to wake him up. He wouldn't wake up. Varuna, the goddess of water, ma entered his genitals and he wouldn't wake up. Yama, the god of death, entered his anus and he wouldn't wake up. Indra entered his hands and he wouldn't wake up. This is why it's such a long chapter, 72 verses. It's describing in detail all this. Vishnu entered his legs and he would not stand up. Rivers entered his blood, but he did not stir. The ocean in the abdomen, oh, entered the abdomen, and hunger arose, but still he would not wake up. Ocean, the oceans. The moon god entered the heart and mind, but still he would not rise. Then Lord Brahma himself enters the heart and intelligence, but still he would not rise. Then Lord Shiva enters the heart and ego, but still he would not rise. Then it's describing how the inner controller, the deity presiding over consciousness, entered the heart with reason, and then he rose up out of the water. So this is like, Gopi gave us some, no, deity of consciousness entered the heart with reason. But Gopi described this morning something very relative, like a child, a baby, you know, in the womb, in consciousness. What is going on with that baby? What, what is actually happening analytically on this level that we're talking about? It's going through all these layers of consciousness, affected by the different senses and sense organs. I have to look in my book. <laughs> it doesn't say the name, I don't think. Just a minute. Huh? huh? I know, I know. I, I don't think it describes it actually at all. Where are we? Just a second. No, I want to answer your question. Just today, I thought I don't have to bring the hard copy of the Bhagavatam. It's so heavy to lug around. And then, you know, he asked me this question. Just a moment, Gopi. No. No, it's not Super Soul. It's just describing the presiding deity of over-consciousness. So this is way down. I'm going to read you the translation, and if there's a purport, I'll read you that also. Listen, listen, listen. This is, this is verse 70. We've come through all these verses to try and wake up Krishna. And the Sanskrit is saying Chaitana or Chitana. Chitana is along with reason, consciousness, and the translation is as I've given. However, when the inner controller, the deity presiding over consciousness, entered the heart with reason, at that very moment, the cosmic being arose from the causal waters, and Prabhupada does not give a comment. So there are no comments for it. Yes. Of the jiva. Yes. Check the dark Now it's covered. Yes. He said like you have. That's right. You have a. 
library of books and it's in an almira and that almira has a, a glass, glass door, yes um, door yes so that becomes covered over and it's yes. cleansed which yes. is the process of devotional service and yes. chanting yes chitta it's the, it's the finest material aspect of covering over the jiva yeah and it's in the mode of goodness also it's just Right. Very good. Did you understand what he said? Say that again. That's perfect. Unmanifested. Yes. No, when the seed enters into those, the seed of the jiva and time, the time factor. So we can understand on different levels. We can understand the immensity of this description. We can also understand the reality of this description. It's not just words. It's not just, you know, some analogy. This is actually what takes place. Otherwise, the Bhagavatam, it's, it's, it's apurushaya. It's manifesting from above. So we don't understand this. If this makes us feel humble, then it's been successful in its presentation also. Yes, but we're spirit soul, yes. So all this presentation. So this is basically, I've said it very, very briefly. And um, it's described that a sleeping man can only be woken up by the super soul. This is the analogy that Prabhupada gives in the verse after this. That we can be woken up by the super soul. You know in the morning, it's described that if you're a godly person, you'll automatically wake up at the Brahma Muhurta time. Automatically, you'll, whether you stay awake or not, but you'll be woken up. Super soul will wake you. And you have a choice to stay awake or not. You may, the mind may want to go back to sleep. But still, you'll be woken up by the super soul, because super soul is in touch with our deepest you know, desires. And then it's saying, therefore, through devotion, detachment, and spiritual knowledge, through concentrated um, devotional service, one should concentrate on the super soul present in the body, although simultaneously apart from it. This is the conclusion of Sankhya philosophy. Kapila Dev was not speaking exclusively to bhaktas. He was, I said the other day, he was speaking to such a wide range of people. And I was just talking to Gopi this morning and appreciating that even now I'm speaking to a wide range of people. How do I know what is the core desire of your heart? It may be for gyan. It may be for devotion. It may be for some material benefit. We don't even know who, what is in the heart of the devotee. What is, in our, what is our real, 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 real aspiration? As we mature, that becomes clearer and clearer and our nishta becomes resolute, becomes completely fixed. But up until that point, you know, we may want to go this way, we may want to go into gyan or mix a bit of gyan with bhakti or take some fruit from this. So even, you know, amongst devotee society, we're never sure. Yes, yeah, we are. It's true. It's not that, because Prabhupada gives us the impression that we're all bhaktas. We're all in Iskon, left, right, you know, we're all doing the same. But actually, we're not at all. Not at all. We all have come from billions of different births for a start. And what are all these different impressions? Now, Gurudev is trying to make an impression of what is the highest conclusion. This is what he gave his life for. I am just a maidservant of Srimati Radharani. This is what he pushed into our consciousnesses. Try and fix. This is your identity. If you go for that and nothing else, even though he's not physically present, still retain that sanskar from him and go forward with that impression every day. Whatever we're hearing here and there, I am still aspiring to be a Paliyadasi of Srimati Radharani. And if I keep saying that enough, in my next birth, I will make progress again towards that. I'll meet a Rasi guru who will again punch me on the line. And again, move me forward, and so on and so on. Go to the Ramanujas, go to Madhvacharya, he would say. Nicely, because the Ramanujas, they have their own nishta. 
Don't ever disrespect anybody. This is another teaching that Kapila Dave will give twice in two more chapters. This understanding of respect for everybody, all jivas. If this is lacking, no bhakti can manifest. No bhakti. And yet we see constantly such a contradiction to that amongst the devotees who are apparently trying to practice Shuddha Bhakti. It's such, you know, an anomaly. It's, it's, it's a strange phenomena. You know, why do we so quickly want to strip someone and hurt them? So quickly we want to do that. It's, anyway, I'm the worst offender. No doubt. Huh? I'm number one. <laughs> No way, brother. So, it's also saying here, this is at the very conclusion of this chapter, that the super soul has no affection for the body, but the soul has affection for the body. Super soul itself is called antaryami. It's a witness. The super soul is witnessing all this. The super soul enters into each jiva as the third purush, Shira Dakshai Vishnu, when those jivas become manifested by Lord Brahma as the progenitor. Lord Brahma, through his agencies of Daksha and different other progenitors, Kardama Muni, they are like Devahuti, she also produces nine daughters and those nine become nine uh, wives of great sages and produce so much progeny on the planet. And within each um, living entity, then um, Super Soul is residing, but only as a witness. It won't make, it'll never impinge on the independence of the jiva. That's forbidden. Because we have chosen to be in this material consciousness, and it is up to us to choose to be out of this material consciousness. There's a lot of responsibility on us. We'll get help through our prayer, and guru, and the sadhus, but really, at the end of the day, it comes down to my decision. Do I want this piece of sense enjoyment, or actually am I going to just say exclusively under Krishna's shelter? And without that independence, I've said so many times, there's no real love. There can't be love. That's why we have the jewel of independence, so that we can demonstrate our pure affection. We have to decide to love this or not. If there was magic powder sprinkled on everyone and all of a sudden, yes, now you love God, that wouldn't be nourishing or happy. We wouldn't be satisfied with that. We've got to independently choose. Yes, I'm coming to you with all my heart and soul. That mood of bhav, that full feeling. Just, can I just finish? Because then I've finished the whole chapter and then we've got a couple of minutes. So the purpose of Sankhya this is the conclusion of this chapter, and I'm really sorry that I've been so briefly through this chapter. But you can understand from when I describe that Virata Rupa, it's, it's quite, um, what do you call, technical. So I haven't dwelt on it excessively, but this is something of a summary of what's in this 26th chapter. The purpose of Sankhya is to detach oneself from the material body. That's the beginning of spiritual life. It's like Sharanagati is the threshold of spiritual life. Gurudev used to describe Sharanagati as like just getting dressed. You can't go in the street until you're dressed. So first of all, you have to do that. And then you can actually start to attend to other things. So first, Sharanagati. And first, detachment. Detach oneself from the material body. That means the material senses. That means we have to understand the material senses. We have to know these... Um, Three categories. I'll read them to you. Very simply, so the five working senses are called the karmendriya, as I described yesterday. Speech, hands, leg, legs, or rather feet. Sorry. Speech, hands, feet, anus, genital. These are five working senses in the body. Then the five knowledge-acquiring senses. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin. These all acquire knowledge. And then there, are the, then there is the mind that is the controller of these senses. And then there is the sense objects, which is form, taste, smell, touch, sound. These are the objects of the senses. And then there are the five elements, which is fire, water, earth, air, ether. These are the objects 
uh, the elements rather. So these all collectively together, they make 24. And the mind, then time is another element separate from this, and then the mind. Now, does, is the mind going to control these senses, or is the mind going to be weak and be controlled by the senses? This is the purpose of Sankhya philosophy, is to teach us some self-control of the mind. Controlling the mind is absolutely imperative as we work along this path. And how flickering is the mind in Kali Yuga? It just bangs around from so quick. But Prabhupada says a very beautiful thing back here. He says that the mind on the material platform is always hovering. It's never still. It's always uncertain. It's unsure. As long as we're on the material platform, we're always imbalanced. It's always like, you know, not quite sure. We get banged by this influence, banged by this influence, knocked out of shape here, banged by here. This is happening, that happening, you know? Chanchala, yes, flickering. If it's on the material platform. But when it starts to approach the spiritual strength of solid, of solid nishta, initially, and then some taste coming, then some attachment for Krishna. Then it becomes balanced. And then you can cope. I remember Gurudev when one big sannyasi, probably his biggest sannyasi, fell down. And he was in Bangalore. And he was opening one restaurant down there. And then Brajanath Prabhu told him, oh, this devotee's actually left his sannyas Vaishnava completely. I mean, one of Gurudev's biggest sannyasis who brought most people to Gurudev. Gurudev sort of looked at the sky for a few moments, very, very disappointed. And they just carried on that day with all his activities, like with an extra boost, practically. This is symptomatic of someone who's called Stita Pragyan. They're fixed in the, you know, sanctuary of the heart, their conception. They're not going to be pushed by the different circumstances. <laughs> as well. But materially, externally. One time I asked Gurudev, what is the meaning of stita pragyan? Stita pragyan means fixed. I wanted to have a picture of it. Gurudev is so kind, he gave me a picture. He leant right forward and he actually looked like a rock. He looked so solid. He looked like a mountain. And I was looking at him for about 30, 40 seconds, and it was like this mountain was sitting in front of me, couldn't be moved. This is Stita Pragya. This is someone who has control their mind and senses. And I saw the same thing in Srila Bhakti Vigyan Bharati Maharaj the other day. The same gravity, the same exact quality that I'd seen in Gurudev, that, that rock solid, nothing to do with the material energy at all. Completely detached. This is the goal of this chapter, to become detached from the material energy by understanding the analysis of how we got into it. We're not actually in it. My spirit is not a part of it, but the illusion makes me think I am. And what is the nature of the illusion is what we've just tried to discuss something of today. That's the, you know, doctor's diagnosis. So when we get the pulse, then we can purify it then we can actually go deeper into our bhakti. Wonderful scientific process, but based on the Bhagavatam. Without the glorious, you know, words of the Bhagavatam, how can we proceed? So this is Kapila Dev's heartfelt instructions to his mother. Right. Intelligence. Uh huh. And the whip? The reins. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. If we listen to our intelligence. We should regularly listen to the intelligence. Like Arjuna is, is saying, sometimes I'm not even listen, I'm listening to the sentiment. I'm not listening to my higher intelligence. Mm -hmm. Chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita is describing exactly the same. 
the method. And Astanga Yoga is one way to control the mind through pranayam, yama, niyama, etc., these different stages of yoga. But bhakti yoga is a much more um, tasteful and simpler way to control the mind, ultimately. is actually giving the whole consciousness up to Krishna to direct, allowing him to control us. And then always looking for what is, it's very simple, really, if you always run everything we do by Gurudev. I mean, whatever. Even you're buying a tube of toothpaste, I said before, you know, what would Gurudev like? You're buying some sabji, you know, what? Am I going to buy something that's not bona fide? I'm wearing cloth. By the way, Gurudev used to say, certainly to his brahmacharis, etc., that they should always wear light color cloth. I mean, Gurudev's given so many instructions on so many things. Also, if we take the time now, because we don't have to run to so many programs, because Gurudev's not banging his gong, calling us to run in the street quickly, because we're about to start the huge Pandal program. We've actually got time now to look at all his instructions. And he's given so many on everything. We don't have to be in any sort of bewilderment or confusion about anything. There's nothing, you know, that can't be reconciled. Srila Gurudev Ki Jai. Thank you so much for all your attention. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare.